So, is that up on both monitors? Oh, great. So, we left off uh, last time, kind of a real uh, quick review of what we had going on last time. We were looking at uh, wor the work energy relationships. We saw that if we had conservation of energy, uh, particularly if we don't have uh, non conservative forces like friction and things like that, uh, that the change in work is equal to zero. That's, that's also the definition of conservation of energy. And we're going to be working some problems, maybe not so much today, but uh, next time we get together, uh, that are some classic conservation problems like the loop-de-loop uh, -loop and a roller coaster and some things like that. Now we'll finish up our, our work uh, for, for this area before we go into impulse and momentum. A few other things to, to review or to look at. Remember, I think we had some symbology that was slightly different than you'd seen in physics, which is fine. That's what life is about. Everyone's got different symbols and different uh, ways of expressing things and different accents. Um, that's what keeps things interesting. We saw that uh, T was our kinetic energy, that V sub G was our potential energy due to uh, gravity, that V sub E was essentially our potential energy due to a spring, or we could say the spring energy. We saw that the uh, units were, of, uh, remember that work is force times distance, so work is equal to force times distance. So we'd expect our units to be units of force and distance. In the English system, we have uh, foot-pounds. In the metric system, we have newtons times meters, and the newtons times meters we usually express as a joule. Also, remember when we had the uh, kinetic energy, we came up with the expression of uh, one-half m v squared. How does that work from a units standpoint? Well, if I look at the units on this expression, one-half m v squared, I've got, and it's a little easier in the metric system, but uh, it would follow through in the English system, We'd have kilograms for mass, and then if I take the velocity of meters per second and I square it, I have meters squared over second squared. And if I regroup this, if I group up a kilogram times a meter over a second squared, that is a newton, isn't it? Isn't that the definition of a newton? So I'd have a newton times a meter. And, of course, that then gets us back to a, a joule. So we saw all of that. Uh, I just wanted to, to, to look at that. Are there questions before we then go on? So going on to new material, we said that we're going to talk about power. Power, def by definition, is the time rate of doing work, or we could say that that is work over time. Uh, we look at the, uh, the classic experiment of maybe you live uh, up on a, uh, uh, a high hill, uh, up on a knoll or something, and uh, we talk about uh, driving up to your, your place. And if we drive up to your place in an old pickup truck, um, and it takes uh, three minutes to get there, and then we repeat the trip maybe in a, uh, a nice fancy car that's of the same weight as the pickup truck that's got a lot of power and it only takes us a minute and a half. Do we, uh, do the, the vehicles exert the same amount of work? They actually do. The work is constant because I assume the elevation of your place has not changed. Is the power the same? No. The vehicle that gets up there faster is going to have to exert more power, right? Okay. Um, so you also get the, you know, the classic example, maybe we'll borrow a little space up here. Let's say that we have a uh, loading dock like this, and uh, someone's, uh, we've got a, a barrel or beer keg or whatever you want to think about there. And you could uh, roll this up here and, and set this up here. Or you could get one of your uh, hefty friends to just uh, grab it and set it up there. And uh, let's say that this took uh, three seconds whereas this only took one second. Okay. Which exerts more work? Which has done more work? They're both the same, aren't they? Okay, Because the distance here is the same. Which would uh, exert more power? Yeah, the scenario that did it in one second, right? Okay, so uh, just to, to give you something to think about there. Well, if we look at a uh, numerical expression, power is equal to force times velocity. Uh, force times velocity. So then if I look at the units, if I look at metric units, I've got units of force times velocity. So newtons times meters per second, which would be a joule per second, which is, of course, the unit of a watt. So that should not surprise us that we get watts there. Now, what about if I look at the English system? I would have pounds. That's your unit for force, and the feet per second, that's velocity, uh, so I'd get foot-pounds per second. Now, if we go down to the auto showroom, they're probably not going to be talking about foot-pounds per second. 
uh, what they do is they group up a bunch of those and we can say that if we take 550 foot-pounds per second, that's one horsepower, and that's probably what they will be bragging about at the uh, auto showroom or something like that. And, and that really just came from they found years ago uh, that one horse properly harnessed could lift uh, 550 pounds, uh, one foot, in one second. So when you start thinking about human-powered vehicles and doing some of those uh, human-powered vehicle challenges, flying in a human-powered vehicle across the English Channel or going uh, underneath the English Channel in a human-powered submarine, you don't have a lot of horsepower to work with, right? Even a well-trained athlete's only going to be able to exert about a quarter horsepower over a period of time. Uh, so something to think about. I always think about uh, giving that uh, uh, comment there, and then a, a student uh, raised his hand and said that uh, I can exert, I can lift 550 pounds a foot in a second. He looked like he probably could, uh, enough so that I probably wasn't going to argue with him. But um, most people are not prepared for that. And even if, you know, you, you're the uh, king of deadlifting down at the gymnasium and you can grab that uh, 550 pounds and set it up on one foot blocks, I think that's going to wear on you to do that every second uh, for a prolonged period of time. Well, how do I tie these two systems together? How do I tie watts and uh, horsepower together, that would be this conversion here, that one horsepower is 746 watts. You can take a, a trip to any uh, store and look at uh, consumer products, and uh, this will start to uh, concern you probably because uh, there's claims made that probably are, are you know, less than true or they waffle with some terms in terms of peak and things like that. I always like uh, vacuum cleaners that are four horsepower. When you use this conversion, there'd be no way that you could plug them in in your house without blowing the breakers and things like that. So um, then, they, then they'll put a little asterisk there and talk about peak horsepower. So maybe that happened over a hundredth of a second or something like that. Uh, so... So it's kind of interesting when you look at uh, things like this. And, and when we get to, to talking about horsepower, that's something that, that comes up too. The, the horsepower they're going to test your automobile with is probably a much different standard than what they're going to test a, a highway truck or something like that. Most highway trucks have to produce power over 10 hours, so you've got to set that up and have that producing that horsepower for at least 10 hours. There's SAE standards on that, whereas a car is just going to be a peak value for maybe just a, a few seconds. So. Um, you, you want to make sure that you're measuring apples to apples and oranges to oranges. I'm not trying to mix those up, so to speak. Questions with that? So um, we're going to talk a lot more about horsepower and torque because that's something that's really messed up. Your author, uh, I shouldn't say messed up, I mean, a lot of people tend to mess it up and confuse it, and there's a lot of things that just aren't true about it. Um, your author doesn't talk about that. does talk about efficiency, so I'll talk about efficiency, and then I'll come back and give you uh, something beyond probably what your author talks about. So we could talk about efficiency, and particularly mechanical efficiency. Okay, <coughs> Mechanical efficiency, we might give that the symbol E sub M for mechanical efficiency, or we give it this kind of this Greek letter eta. Uh, looks like an N with a uh, swoosh on it. And it's really the ratio of the power out over the power in. Okay, and that's a pretty good equation for you to stick with. Unfortunately, we live in a world where oftentimes, most of the time, almost all of the time, we get less out than we put in. Uh, you look at the efficiency of your transmission, whether it's an automatic or a manual, you will get less power out than you put in. Okay, where does the, uh, where does the loss go? Probably noise, you might hear the gears, heat, you know, drive it hard to school and crawl underneath and try and put your hand on it, whether it's an automatic or a manual, it's probably going to be pretty hot. If it's automatic, it's probably having to displace uh, heat through some sort of a radiator system. So uh, you can have some losses. If we look at larger systems like an entire automobile, the uh, chemical energy that's available in the gasoline or the diesel that you put in your rig compared to what you get out is usually somewhere in the high 20s to low 30s. A uh, diesel system will be a little more efficient than a gasoline system. So, uh, this is where, you know, the electric vehicle, you have to be careful of, of where you draw your line around the system. They, they, they say they're much more efficient, but then you got to look at, well, where do they get the electricity? Uh, we get very efficient electricity in here because the water can, tends to uh, run down the river all the time. But when you go, um, you know, back east, or I guess we got a coal burning plant in eastern Oregon, but that's much more common as you go across the United States. Uh, that's probably not so efficient, so you have to you have to look at that. So, 
not trying to uh, you know call out anything on the electric car or whatnot. But you got to look at the whole thing. Got to look at the battery life cycle. You got to look at refining petroleum and, and the, the whole picture there. But typically, efficiency is out over in. And if you get an efficiency greater than one, you probably need to look at it. Okay. Now, if anyone's trying to sell you an efficiency greater than one, there are some, some sometimes coefficients of performance on heat pumps. You can get greater than one, but most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, your efficiency is less than one. Okay. Uh, probably suffice to say all the time it's less than one. Well, let's look at horsepower and torque. I want to go into this a, a little bit more. Um, I guess maybe backing up on, on efficiency, that just costs us. We just have to put more into the system, right? So it'll just cost us. And moving to, to, to horsepower and torque, if I look at measuring uh, horsepower, we never measure horsepower directly. Uh, probably what we're going to do is we're going to put the, the engine up on some sort of a, a dyno. So I'll have an engine here, I guess, uh, like this. Okay. I guess it needs an intake manifold, doesn't it? A big carburetor. Okay. Uh, so we've got the engine there, and probably what we're going to do is we're going to hold the engine here with some mechanism and hold the engine there, and then we'll hook the uh, engine to some sort of a dyno. I mean, we could hook it to an electric generator, couldn't we? And then uh, use that electrical energy and start to load it up. That would be an efficient way to do a dyno. Or we could use a water break or something like that. But one of the things that we will probably do is as this uh, engine is turning, we'll probably have to have some tension here and some compression there to, keep, to resist the torque of that engine, right? So we're basically going to be measuring torque and we're going to be measuring RPM. Okay? You don't measure horsepower directly. You measure torque and you measure RPM. Is this right for an engine? Most engines turn, when you crank start an engine, you turn it that way. Is that right? So the resistance will be there. What motor mount always breaks? Is it the driver's side motor mount or the passenger side? Driver's side motor mount usually breaks because it's in tension. I mean, that's why we ended up on driving on this side of the car. We were trying to balance out the engine. So we're going to measure that torque. There's going to be some tension here. There's going to be some some uh, compression there and we can also fairly easily measure RPM so what do we do with that torque and RPM well if we go back and we look at the definition that we saw of horsepower where one horsepower was equal to 550 foot-pounds per second that was just from uh, the uh, an accounting of that 550 foot-pounds per second is equal to a horsepower if I turn this to uh, instead of feet uh, foot-pounds per second to foot-pounds per minute I'm just going to multiply this 550 by, uh, what, 60, and I come up with 33,000 foot-pounds per minute. Okay, and then I would like you to, to imagine this little mental experiment here, and I'll maybe say this is a top view. Okay, I have, uh, maybe we could take the floor over here and we put a uh, weight on it. Um, that offers a pound of resistance. Okay, and the reason I say this is a top view is we don't want to think about this in a vertical plane because while it might have resistance when it's going up, it wouldn't have resistance when it's coming down. So you want to think about it in a horizontal plane where it has maybe one pound of resistance due to friction. And no matter where we are on this thing, as we go around this circle, it's offering one pound of resistance. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so I've got one pound of resistance, and I have this on an arm that's a foot long. So as I go around this uh, circle, the circumference of this is pi d, which if it has a radius of one foot, the circumference is going to be pi times two feet, the diameter being two feet. So if I look at the work per revolution, remember that work is force times distance, so I have that pound of force times the distance, which is two feet times pi, and that's for each revolution. So I grab the calculator, I take one pound and multiply it by two times pi, and I get 6.28 pound feet per revolution. So now I come back and I take this number here, this 33,000 pound feet per minute, and I divide it by this number here, 6.28 pound feet per revolution, and I come up with the important number of 5,252 revolutions per minute. And what that really means is over here we can say that one pound foot of torque at 5,252 RPMs is one horsepower. Okay, so if you're running this engine here and you have uh, one pound foot of torque, 
which hopefully you're going to have more than that. That'd be a pretty sick engine, but uh, and I mean sick in the uh, not good sense. So one pound foot of torque, and you have uh, 5,252 RPMs. It is producing one horsepower. If you have a hundred pound feet of torque, now we're getting somewhere at 52.52. We're producing a hundred horsepower, right? So what we can do is we can come up with this equation that horsepower is equal to torque times RPM divided by 52.52. So when you go to dyno something, you don't measure the horsepower. You measure the torque, you measure the RPM, and you compute the horsepower. So now when you go and you look at a graph of, let's say, RPM and horsepower, and it'll probably do something like this. And maybe we put over here torque. And maybe the torque drops off like this. There's going to be a value where they intersect. And what value is that? 52.52. So now you can go and look at all these uh, torque curves and horsepower curves that they're trying to sell you in magazines and whatnot. And if they don't, have the same value at 52.52, they're lying to you. Not usually. And sometimes before you, you know, start to write a nasty letter to the editor, they will change the scale on torque and horsepower, so be careful of that. If they actually are being legit, it's just a little hard to see. But a lot of people, this is an area where there's a lot of wise tales and stuff made up and whatnot, um, and this, this is the real scoop here. Horsepower and torque are exactly the same, have to be the same, at 5,252 RPM, because that's how you calculate it. So, questions with that? Give you something to think about. With a greater RPM, the, um, and torque, yeah, the, the, the torque, the RPM is greater, that means the horsepower is less, but our torque is greater. Uh, you, this, uh, the horsepower usually increases with RPM. And torque tends to, in a practical sense, drop off with RPM. Okay, uh, and, and that's a practicality that I'm not not you know prepared to get into today. But I will tell you those two curves are the same at 52.52. And it's that the shape of these curves and where they are on the graph that absolutely depends on the engine, whether it's gas engine, diesel, and things like that. And sometimes you may not see them cross because I mean a, a diesel. How many diesels turn at 52.52? Not too many, right? Okay. Yeah, another question? Heat, heat is energy. Usable energy. It's usable. I like my electric blanket. I use that. <laughs> uh, or you could use a... Uh, I mean, you could use a, like a thermal pile and turn it back into electricity. The, the problem with that is you always get less out. I mean, you get uh, you know, when you study thermodynamics, those of you that are civil and mechanical take thermodynamics, and the bad news is you can't get ahead. And then they then the day then it gets really bad. The next day in lecture, you find out you can't even break even. So you always lose as you make those conversions. Well, it will it will displace some of your losses. But you're never going to get back to the original. Because it adds weight and expense. So. Other questions with that? So. Well, let's try some uh, examples here. So I guess the, the last thing, practical piece of information, like I said, almost all engines looking at the front of them rotate this way. Anyone had to crank start something? Old car, tractor. You always want to be careful when you do this. You want to stand over here because sometimes on a startup they'll backfire, which means they jerk that way. Okay, and if you're standing over here, then the crank comes in and breaks your arm or your hip or something like that. Okay. So... You always, you always stand over here. And actually grab the uh, crank like a monkey would. Pretend like you don't have an opposable thumb. 
you don't want to put your thumb over it because yeah, it'll break your thumb. So I had one backfire on me, on me years ago. It makes a believer out of you. It broke the crank off right in my hand. So anyway, but I was standing where I should have been, so it was uh, it was not bad. No stitches required. Let's try this uh, problem here. We've got a, a scenario where we are yarding or pulling a log. We've got an 800-pound log here. This is the uh, northwest. We've got a log there. I guess we still cut some of these. And uh, we're skidding it. We're yarding it up this ramp, a uh, 30-degree ramp. Uh, we don't know the coefficient of friction. Presumably, there's a coefficient of friction. We're pulling it up at a constant 4 feet per second. And we're doing this with a cable that comes up over this pulley, changes its direction, and is wrapped onto this winch. And this winch is being uh, driven with six horsepower. So I don't know whether it's being driven with a gas engine or electric uh, motor or what it is, but we're putting six horsepower of energy or, or six horsepower into that. So let's see if we can come up with the coefficient of friction. And then we'll, we'll ask the question, what happens if we put more horsepower into it? So to do this, I'd like to, I'm, I'm looking for the coefficient of friction here. I'm going to start out with a free body diagram on this thing, so I'll go ahead and uh, draw this uh, log then. And we're going to have some tension T that that cable and winch arrangement is, is pulling on this thing. And I'm going to then have the, uh, we said 800 pounds for the weight of that uh, log. And I'd have the normal force, the uh, ramp is, is pushing on that width. And then, of course, the friction force opposing us, that would be mu times the coefficient of friction n, right? So I think I'll rotate my coordinate system here. And I want to say that I have x up the ramp and y perpendicular to the ramp. Okay. And maybe I'll say this angle in there, that is our 30 degrees. So with that, if I uh, sum the forces in the y direction, setting the to mass times acceleration in the y direction, what's the acceleration in the y direction? Hopefully zero. Hopefully it's not bouncing up and down on the ramp. So hopefully that's zero. So it's like statics again. So I could say in the y direction, which I'm going to take a positive this way, I have n minus 800 times the uh, cosine of 30. Anything else? Everything else is perpendicular, so that's equal to zero. So n turns out to be equal to 800 times the uh, cosine of 30, which is, uh, what, 693 newtons. Well, that worked okay. What if we sum the forces then in the x direction, sending equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction? Now again, what's the acceleration in the x direction? I mean, the best piece of information in the whole problem statement is this, right? No matter how cool the log looks, we could even put some knots in here, maybe even put a little spotted owl here going up into the uh, head saw. Okay. The best piece of information on this is that this is a constant four feet per second. We have to be careful. We wrote, if we wrote four feet per second, we might be tempted to think that that's constant, but maybe it's just a snapshot in time. When we came out here and we said, well, this is constant, if that's constant, this has to be equal to zero, doesn't it? Uh, let's see, whatever units are we in? Pounds, yes, thank you very much. 693 pounds, very good. Okay. And that brings up, I was watching the, uh, I'm sure no one's ever got sidetracked on YouTube videos, but uh, I was watching how it's made. I, I just find those fascinating. And, uh, I, you know, I was watching them make garden pitchforks and uh, you know, baseballs and everything. But with the garden pitchforks, they were bragging about how much force they were pushing the handle into the uh, the, the metal piece with. And they, it was in, uh, uh, I assume, England. They all had that kind of an accent. But it was so many kilograms of force. What do you think of that? That's just a mess, isn't it? Okay, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't even sure what I was watching at that point. So, so uh, yeah, I mean, we got a mess with slugs and whatnot, but uh, they got a system where then they refer back to uh, kilograms of force, whatever the world that is. So, thank you for correcting me on this. Okay, so let's uh, do this x direction. I'm going to go ahead and take uh, up the ramp as positive, and we will then have. Uh, T that's going up the ramp minus mu 
times n, where I can make the substitution for n of 693 pounds. So I've got t, I've got, I'm uh, subtracting mu times n, and it looks like I also need to subtract 800 times the sine of 30 degrees. And that's going to be equal to zero. Now I still have a problem. I have two unknowns. I have the tension t and I have the coefficient of friction mu that's uh, both unknown. But remember I have one more equation. We have yet another piece of information. We have six horsepower. So remember that horsepower is equal to force times velocity. So the force in here is the tension on that cable, so that's T. So I can say then that T is equal to the horsepower divided by the velocity. So I take this uh, 6 times 550, and I divide by the velocity. What's our velocity? 4. Okay. So that turns out to be equal to 825 pounds. Now, did the units work out on that? I had uh, 6 uh, horsepower times uh, 550 foot-pounds per second per horsepower. And then what was 4 in the denominator? Feet per second. So I get to cancel the horsepower, I get to cancel that, I get to cancel this, and indeed I come up with pounds. So 825 pounds. That's what that's uh, giving us. So now I can take and I can put that up in there, and I can uh, solve for uh, mu sub t equals 825 pounds in, and calc the coefficient of friction, and the coefficient of friction turns out to be equal to 0 0.613, which seems reasonable. If I got something less than 0, I'd be very suspect. If I got something a little over 1, I might be worried about it. If I got something that was like 20, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd discount that too. Um, but that seems very reasonable between 0 and 1. Yes? Uh, well, this is not a pulley. This is a, a, a winch. And yeah, and if the, if the winch drum were not round, you'd be pulling it in at, at different rates. I, mean, I think they had uh, cranks or uh, sprockets like that on bicycles to help you in different parts of the stroke. Yeah, so you, it, it would change the problem indeed. Now, uh, maybe along those lines, we're going to ask, what happens if all of a sudden we change this to 8 horsepower? Okay. Change it to eight horsepower. I mean, we look at our watch. We got to get the uh, get this done. Quitting time's coming. So what do we do? We give it more current. We give the electric motor some uh, some more current, or we uh, uh, put more fuel in the gas engine. Fairly common uh, occurrence if you look at uh, the history of vehicles or tractors or something like that. They will uh, take one engine, and all of a sudden the next year it produces another twenty five horsepower or something like that. And it's same bore and stroke. What do they do? They just run it a little faster, okay? Or they put a little bigger carburetor on it or something. So we uh, add a little more fuel to this thing, and we get 8 horsepower. So what's going to happen with 8 horsepower? Maybe I will uh, separate this so we don't confuse this. I leave another page here. Okay, so with 8 horsepower... If I were to rearrange this equation, I would have that the tension T is equal to P over V, which is going to be 8 times 550 divided by now 4. And you might say, well, can, is it still going to be 4 feet per second? Yeah, initially, um, when we switch to 8 horsepower, it's still going to be going 4 feet per second. Then it's going to start to accelerate, right? What we'd like to do is maybe we'd like to find that acceleration. So if I do this, the tension turns out to be equal to 1,100 pounds. So if at 825 we didn't have any acceleration, if when we go to uh, 1,100 pounds, we're going to have some acceleration, aren't we? Now as far as the sum of the forces in the y direction is equal to zero, that's going to be the same, isn't it? Nothing's changed on that one, and I can say then that n is still equal to 693 pounds. But in the x direction... 
If I look at summing the forces in the x direction, setting equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction, have things changed there? Yeah, this is definitely not zero. Okay. We reach down, we uh, increase the throttle on the thing. We expect it to accelerate from four feet per second up to some some new value. It'll find some new constant. What's that acceleration going to be? Well, let's look at this equation. We would have T minus mu times 693 minus 800 times the sine of 30. And this is not equal to zero, but is rather equal to the mass, which I have to be really careful with. In the English system, we're going to take that 800 and divide it by 32.2 because we're in feet and uh, pounds. And then I'm going to have my acceleration. I'm going to say it's a positive acceleration because I'm going to assume that the acceleration is up the ramp. So now I put 1100 in here because we got that there. Is the coefficient going to be friction going to be the same? Yeah, coefficient of friction should be the same. So I can put that what we found 0 0.613 in here. And I have everything except for the acceleration, so I can say then the acceleration is going to be equal to 11.07 feet per second squared. Okay, about a third g, which seems reasonable. Okay, so we really worked two problems here. We worked the first problem with constant acceleration to come up with the coefficient of friction. And then we said, well, what happens if we increase the horsepower? We're going to accelerate it, right? You do this all the time in your car. You're driving along. All of a sudden, you get past the police officer. And what do you do? You give it more throttle. You accelerate, don't you? Okay? So... Well, let's try uh, one more problem here for the uh, the day. This is kind of an unlikely problem, but a, a good problem. We've got a scenario here where we've got a, a truck with an 80 kilogram crate on it, so we're definitely not to the load capacity of the truck. Must be on a return trip home or something. It's an empty crate or something. And we're told the truck starts from rest and attains a speed of 72 kilometers per hour in 75 meters. Okay, on a level road with constant acceleration. We'd like to find the work done by the friction force on this crate if the fr coefficient of friction is 0.3. So we've got the uh, truck driver has got an empty crate on here. Apparently uh, didn't uh, to tie it on. Uh, is maybe not too worried about losing it. And we would like to find out the work done by the friction force if that crate is not to move on that truck as that truck accelerates up to some speed. Well, with constant acceleration, we can go back and use our kinematics equation. That's where we you know, continue to build on things this term. Remember that we had V squared was equal to V naught squared plus uh, 2 times the acceleration times the displacement S, right? That was one of our kinematics equations if we had constant acceleration. So I could say that uh, velocity squared is equal to 2 times A times S because the initial velocity at starting from rest would be 0. And then uh, the acceleration A is equal to V squared divided by 2S. So what are we going to have? We will have, what was our velocity? 72 divided by 3.6. When I convert, um, this number is uh, meters per second then. That's why I have that 3.6 there. 3,600 uh, seconds in an hour and 1,000 uh, meters in a kilometer. And then I'm going to have a 2 times 75. And since I've got this in now meters per second, I can just leave that at 75. You could have converted that 75 to kilometers, but then we've got to get the acceleration in kilometers per second or hour, and we'd still have a mess. This way we come up with 2.67 meters per second squared, which is, what, about a third of the acceleration of gravity, which is probably pretty good for a truck, but uh, certainly not unreasonable. So we've got that. So now I'm going to go and I'm going to look at a free body diagram of that crate. Okay, so there's a free body diagram of the crate. And we have the weight, which is going to be 80 kilograms. 
times the acceleration of gravity, 9.81. That gives me the, uh, the weight. The normal force here, I'm going to have, if I'm uh, accelerating this thing, I'll assume the truck's accelerating to the right. I wish I could accelerate backing up, right? Okay, so accelerating there, we'll assume it's uh, accelerating to the right. And I have the uh, force here. And I'm not ready to call that the force of friction. I'm just going to say that that's the force that's giving it the acceleration. So I'll just call that F. Well, if I sum the forces in the vertical direction here, setting it equal to mass times acceleration in the vertical, I got zero vertical acceleration, hopefully. And we come to the conclusion then that the normal force N is equal to 80 times 9.81, right? Okay, so then I could look at the uh, force required for acceleration. I could uh, sum the forces in the horizontal direction, setting it equal to mass times acceleration in the horizontal direction, and that's going to be F. Let's see, anything else in the horizontal? No. Is equal to the mass, which is 80 times the acceleration. What acceleration do we have? 2.67. So this turns out to be equal to 213 newtons. Okay, 213 newtons. So this is the uh, force required for acceleration. So if that crate has to stay with the truck, it's going to take 213 newtons to keep that with the truck. So our question now is, can the friction force deliver that much force? So let's talk about the friction. So if I look at the uh, friction force, we know that the friction force, and I'll say that this is a uh, friction, is equal to mu times n, right? What's our coefficient of friction? 0 0.3 times what's our normal force? 80 times 9.81, so this is the normal force, and we get a number here that is 235. Okay, so that's the force that friction will deliver. Well, we should be happy because this is greater than 213, so it's not going to slip off the truck, right? I mean, there's probably some question that this crate might have just ended up slipping off the truck. I don't know if you've ever been around a pickup truck with a slick metal bed. You know, you've got some stuff in the back. And all of a sudden, you know, you're going to test out or burn the carbon out of it at the stoplight. And uh, you head out, and the stuff in the back doesn't keep up with you, right? Okay. So... We don't have to worry about the crate coming off the back of it because this is uh, large enough. Now, let's answer the question. Find the work done by the friction force. This is a little deceiving here because I'm not completely sure that it's the friction force. I know that work is equal to force times distance, right? So in this case, what force do I use? Do I use the 235? It didn't need 235. What did it need? 213. Okay, so I only use a portion of the available friction force. So I'm going to have 213 times the distance. How far did that go? 75 meters, right? So this turns out to be um, 16,000 uh, joules, which would be 16 kilojoules if you want. Okay. You know, I don't know that we're worried too much about calculating the work done by friction forces, but this is an important problem to, to think about and to break down into, into pieces. Yes? Uh, for acceleration, what do we get? 3.6. 3.6, that thing comes from our conversion of we have 1,000 uh, meters is equal to 1 kilometer, and we also have that uh, 3,600 seconds is equal to one hour because I had to convert my kilometers to uh, per hour to meters per second. Other questions? Well, where we'll go uh, next time is do some of those classic uh, problems with work and energy that we have conservation. Uh,
here's one where we've got a spring that's stretched and a weight and we're going to release it and the weight's going to come sliding down here and how do you know this is a conservative problem well negligible friction okay if this slider can come sliding down on that bar with negligible friction it uh, really is screaming that it's a conservation of energy problem of course we'll do the uh, the classic uh, roller coaster where you do the loop to loop and try and figure out how much uh, speed you need going into that thing as we finish up problems in this section and this chapter before moving to impulse and momentum so see you then